chosen me love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Sing it again. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. God. Yes, Lord. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God.
child of God. You split the sea. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowning perfect love. You rescue me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. You believe I am a child of God. Oh, I am a child of God. Oh, yes. I am a child of God. Because I'm no longer. Child of God, cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God, singing like you mean it. I am. I am a child of God. Cause I am a child of God. Oh, man. Well, I am ready for the word today. I hope that you are. Oh, man. You know, you almost, start, you almost hate to start a sermon this way uh, because I kind of feel like I'm, I'm at risk of losing a few people like right here in the beginning. But I, I have to tell you that, that today's message is not pretty, uh, but it, it does have a silver lining. And, and the silver lining is that God loves you so much that he wants to penetrate your heart. Come on and say amen. amen. There's an attack fly up here right now. Uh, God wants, there really is, I'm not just, you know. Uh, he wants to penetrate your heart, and he wants to do something inside of you today that maybe you have tried other avenues to heal and fix in your heart, but nothing else has worked. God can help you today. There's some things we're going to talk about that I think are, this fly, what is the deal? <laughs> with this fly. Okay, I have ne in 30 years of preaching the gospel, I have never swatted at a fly ever, ever before while I'm up here. But uh, I don't know, Clifford, please edit this part. I know at live at home, we can't get live at home and seeing this, but please edit the fly incident out of uh, the, the, the live stuff. Go with me to 1 John chapter 5. If the fly's not dead, I at least uh, scared it, <laughs> okay? First John chapter 5, I know your hearts are ready for the word today. Uh, this is the second message. I think there may be three or four total, but this is the second message of a series simply entitled Victim No More. And I'm taking it from beginning in First John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, simply says this, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith, who is, who, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Part of our freedom, and we've been on such a long journey this year, haven't we? I keep waiting as one series comes to a close. I keep saying, okay, now I can go on to something completely different. And then Holy Spirit taps me on the shoulder and says, ah, not yet. And so we have just continued to talk about our hurts, our hang-ups, and our habits in life. No matter what it is, whether it be chemical dependency or whether it be something of, of, of a mental health issue or anger, depression, anxiety, uh, could be, you know, it could be drug addiction. Our hurts, our habits, our hang-ups, we've been talking about them so regularly. And as we got out of the last series, which was living a life of transformation, learning how to live a life of transformation, last Sunday, I felt that all... Two weeks prior to last Sunday, Holy Spirit had been speaking to my heart about a particular subject, and it happens to be the subject 
of a victim mentality. Let me give you a few things. If you were not here last Sunday, I'm just going to say a few things, a couple of minutes here to catch you up really to where we're at, and we're going to build on that foundation this morning. So what we have already talked about is that we are learning, I have a PowerPoint for this, how to think higher, see broader, and care deeper. The only way that you're going to overcome past hurts, hang-ups, and habits, the only way that you will overcome future hurts, hang-ups, and habits is by changing the way you think. You've got to think higher, you've got to see things broader, and you've got to care deeper. This is a discipline that we use to ask a very important question. And we have been talking about this question. I think I preached a series on this like a year. I did. It's actually one of the banners from last year is up here on the wall to your far left, avoiding the edge. The very first principle we talked about is wisdom. And it was way back then that we started talking about in, at every invitation, every opportunity, every relationship, we need to discipline our minds to ask ourselves this question. We need to look at our past in light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing for me to do. I promise you, if you take that question before God, you take that question to, to with your spouse and you look at this question together before invitations, before relationships, before opportunities, I promise if you give these things over to God, that God will give you heavenly wisdom. We're going to see that in just a little bit here in Scripture later this morning. So just kind of hold with me. This is what we've been talking about. One of the ways... That the enemy victimizes you through you is to cause you to have a poor personal self-portrait. Go ahead. I think we have a picture here of, of this. We've talked about it. Your self-portrait is your self-confidence, your self-image, your self-respect, and your self-worth. When those are compromised, guys, and this is not just for ladies. The next PowerPoint is beep. Men, when those areas of your life are compromised, it will not only affect the decisions you make, but I told you last week it'll, it'll affect the way people treat you. In my own personal walk with the Lord, there is probably nothing that has caused me any more to sacrifice my future hopes and dreams than allowing the enemy to beat me up in these areas. And so what do I do? The next PowerPoint is that a person who allows themselves to have this victim mentality, they suffer from self-abasement, self-humiliation, putting yourself down and belittling you. And as I thought about these things as, as much as three weeks ago before starting this series last Sunday, I, I was drawn, Holy Spirit drew me to this portion of Scripture. And he said to me, Darren, you are born of God. How many of you today are born of God in this place? Come on, show me a hand today. He said, Darren, you're, you're born of God. And because you are born of God, you overcome this world. How many of you want to overcome this world? He said, this is the victory. The victory is to overcome the world. How? By faith. You're born of God. You have faith. Who is it? Who is he? Darren, that overcomes the world? The one who believes that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of his life. I'm here to tell you today that God's plan for you is victim no more. We did this last week. Will you help me out? Victim? No. Victim? No. One more. Victim? No. I hope you mean it today. Because we're going to dive into this a little bit farther, and it, it, it has the ability to be a little bit painful. But no pain, no gain. Come on, somebody say amen. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> no pain, no gain. And I'm going to tell you, for me, Rick, Donna, this has been painful this week for me to look at some of these things. And so it's my honor and privilege to be able to share them with you because Jesus loves you. And the first thing that I want to ask today, and you can just jot this down. And if you're new here today, we're so glad you're here. Uh, we also heard that City Church uh, had 
complete power outage in their building, was unable to have church today. So I think there are some visiting this morning, and we're glad that you're here. But if you're here today for the first time or you're new, uh, it won't offend me at all if you want to take pictures of the slides, uh, the scriptures that are behind me. Um, just, let, just give me a fair warning so that I can pose. Okay, I, I know these, these jokes get old, but it's great to have new people because they actually laugh at the jokes I've told a hundred times here. But, but here's my question. How did I get this way? How did I get to the point to having a victim's mentality? How did I allow it to rob? And this is what it does. See, it robs you of good opportunities. It robs you of desired invitations. And it robs you of healthy relationships. And then this is what happens when you have a victim mentality. You get jealous over the people who are getting the invitations, the people who are having those healthy relationships, and the people who are getting the opportunities. We get jealous. And then, you know, jealousy in any flavor is, is not good. It's, it's, always, it's always got a bitter back taste to it. How do we get to this place? We talked about a lot of things. This message is fully online. I think it's also on our Facebook page. Thank you, Clifford. So if you want to get all of last Sunday's message, you can find it very easily. But we have to address this now. How did I get this way? Gave you last Sunday six common signs of a victim mentality. If you really want to be free, you want to avoid future hurts, hang-ups, and habits. If you really have some big future hopes and dreams, you have to overcome the victim mentality. And these were six signs. I'm not going to read all of them, but they're all listed here. The first five basically define or, or uh, show us what a, what a victim mentality feels like, what it looks like. And how it thinks. The first five. This morning, and we're going to make this, we're going to highlight this real quick. Ready? I love this. Beep. We're going to look at number six. Because number six gives us some answers. Again, number, the first five kind of sets up how someone with a victim mentality thinks. Um, how they, how they, what it looks like and, and, and what it feels like. But, but this sixth principle, I have, to, I have to really go here and spend some time because it helps us to realize that if we're keeping painful memories alive and even when we're taking revenge because a victim mentality invites jealousy of others who have invitations, relationships, and opportunities that we don't. And sometimes it can be very vindictive and vengeful. So I skipped that middle, and that is not forgiving. Everybody say just not forgiving with me. It would be the last time I'll ask you to say this particular item this morning. Ready? Not forgiving. Ready? Not forgiving. I, I've preached entire messages on this topic of forgiveness before. But there's no doubt in my mind, personally, my personal journey, friends who are transparent with me, pastor friends who are transparent with me, couples that Karen and I have been friends with for years, will all say the same thing, oftentimes say the same thing, that the road to healing from our past hurts is learning how to forgive. Amen? Amen. It's quite possible that somebody here this morning has suffered an absolutely deep wound that broke your life. Wounds that you experienced, I'll tell you this today, wounds that you experienced maybe early in life are harder to heal as time goes by. So you know what we do? We try to forget them. Forget, forgotten, gone, erased. Anybody familiar with Rose Kennedy? Rose Kennedy, if you have any knowledge of, of history going back before the Kennedys that some of us who were in our 50s would 
would know. Uh, Rose, Rose Kennedy is kind of like the matriarch of the Kennedy family. And she was a philanthropist and, and just there are so many of her quotes around today that especially those of us who might be over 40, if, if you are saying something quote-wise, you could, you could be quoting her and not even know it. She has so many quotes. But here's a quote from her. She said this. She said, It's been said that time heals all wounds. Her words, not mine, I don't agree. The wounds remain, she said. Time, the mind, protecting its sanity covers them with some scar tissue, and the pain lessens, but it's never gone. If you saw my social media post um, this week, I basically asked a handful of questions that I also want to ask here today. Again, hey, this is not going to be pretty going in, but I promise you it's going to have some silver lining and some great resolution opportunities at the end. So just hold on with me. What happened to you? What assault, what, what abuse, what neglect? What caused you your pain in the past? What did you suffer? What, what emotional, physical, or sexual mistreatment were you exposed to? Who, who victimized you? You know, we're sitting here today, all mostly all friends and family. I met a few new faces beforehand. As my wife said, family that's here uh, specifically for a funeral here in town this weekend. But for the most part, everybody here, I, I know you, I know your life, and I would consider you friends and hope that you would consider me the same. But sometimes we never, well, I should say, Danny, oftentimes we never know what each other's hurts are because we don't talk about them. Why don't we talk about them? We don't talk about them because we buried them. We don't talk about them because it happened early in life and a lot of time has passed and I've learned how to bury these things way deep in my mind. Out of sight, out of mind. Out of mind, out of sight. Doesn't matter how you flip that around, it's not true. One of the healthiest things I've ever had happen in my life we are seven, we're about to be eight weeks into our Celebrate Recovery on Thursday nights. One of the things that I love about Celebrate Recovery is the personal journey that I had, that I'm having, but have had over this past year with two other fellas who we got because, you know, if you're going to lead, if you're going to teach, you best have experienced. And we've had an opportunity to talk about those even private and personal things. And somebody would say, man, oh, come on, I, I could see a bunch of women doing that, but I'm not so sure that a bunch of men would let those walls down. Well, ladies, I got news for you. Men, men will let their walls down too in the right place, in the right environment with the right people. When we feel safe, no different than a lady, right? When you're amongst women and you feel safe, you'll let those walls down and you'll talk and you'll share from the deepest of your pains. This isn't blabbing to everybody so that everybody knows your business. No, this is therapeutical. This is getting with a group of Christian men who will trust God, who will realize that we're not God. And our lives, listen to me, and our minds are unmanageable. I have to recognize a higher power, Jesus Christ, is the one who will come into my life. And when I commit my life to him, and I commit everything to him, both past, present, and future, he has a way of coming into my life and making sense out of nonsense. He has a way of coming into my life and healing me in places where I'm here to tell you today, no pill, no medication, and at times no counselor can break through and, or help you break through and get that healing. And you guys know that I believe 100% in counseling. I thank God for Christian counselors. My wife and I at times over the years have, have seen Christian counselors intentionally, yes, and, and on purpose. Why? Because they're people who love the Lord and they're trained in an area of ministry 
specifically designed to help you and I to process things that, help us, that hurt us in the past, but to get us through and to help us to realize that God wants to take what the enemy meant for bad and he wants to use it for good in my life. Can you say amen to that? Come on. Don't get quiet on me. Don't get too quiet on me. Might not be a lot of amen spots here this, in this message, so you better take them when you can get them. <sighs> Who hurts you? Who victim, victimized you? The majority of individuals with a victim mentality, chances are great that you were introduced to being a victim when you were young. And more likely than not, it was not only while you were very young, but you made every attempt to protect your sanity by burying it deep. You thought that these memories put deep enough. You thought that maybe if enough time passed, they wouldn't affect you. I think Holy Spirit is helping us to realize, Frank, especially this year, the type of preaching and teaching that you've had this year, I think Holy Spirit is helping me and you and whoever would listen to understand that you and I, I've got to sometimes dig deep and let, let God heal us deeply because neither attempting to bury thoughts deep into your mind nor a lapse of time will heal all wounds. Somebody should take a snapshot of this and post it on your Facebook today. This is a powerful statement. And it's a statement that if you truly want freedom from past hurts, You'll embrace this. If your personal self-portrait, okay, we said this before, right? A few moments ago, too. If, you're, if your personal self-portrait, your self-confidence, your self-image, your self-respect, your self-worth has been influenced by your hurts, then what has happened, hear me today, and I'm going to move into some, another point, your past hurts have manipulated have affected, have impacted, and altered your self-portrait through three things. You might want to jot this down or snap a picture of this. Domination, manipulation, and intimidation. And I'm here to tell you that you and I don't need somebody else to do this to me. Unfortunately, I have the same ability that you do, and that is to allow myself by the enemy to intimidate myself, to dominate myself, and to manipulate myself through self-abasement, putting myself down. I'm nobody. Nobody cares about me. Nobody appreciates me. Somebody else always gets picked. It's easy for me to invite jealousy for those who are getting the invitations and the opportunities and have what I would see a healthy relationship. It's easy for me to look and to become jealous. And, and then when something goes wrong, oh my goodness, especially if somebody who I am envying and I am jealous of does me wrong or does me dirty, boy, the temptation to be vengeful just soars to the highest mountain. It's like... Ooh, you're the wrong person to throw stones at me. I could have taken that from a complete stranger. I could have taken that from somebody I didn't work with. I could have taken that from somebody I'm not married to. I could have taken that from somebody who's not my daddy. I could have taken that from somebody who doesn't pastor me. I could have taken that from anybody but you. And my jealousy is manipulating, dominating, and intimidating and hurting my ability. Here's three stories. Some of you have heard this before. I preached a message on forgiveness a couple of years ago, I think. You may be a little familiar, but we have a lot of new faces in our church. And there's a lot of folks not here today. So if you're watching us uh, via our live stream, we're glad that you're watching today. Um, the first story is, is of, and these, this is a true story, by the way, it's, 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 and i am obviously changed the names to protect individuals, and it's nobody from the Midwest, I'll tell you that, so <laughs> don't, don't, don't look around, okay? It's, this is nobody in the Midwest, but um, true story, um, Charlie and Tammy were a Christian couple who go to church. 
And um, one, af- one Sunday afternoon, uh, Tammy and, and Charlie laid down to take their, their Sunday afternoon nap. And Tammy, with great conviction and great remorse and great pain in her life, she rolls over and she tells her husband, Charlie, that she's been having an affair. They're a young couple. Charlie is completely wrecked. He's completely devastated. Matter of fact, so much so that he turns his back on his wife. He turns his back on the Lord. He turns his back on the church. I'll tell you, to date, Charlie is in bad shape. Uh, Charlie keeps jobs just long enough to earn a few bucks to drink. He, He drinks out of control, completely unmanageable. He's been in and out of bed in relationships with with women after his wife, way too many to even count. Charlie is in bad shape. In this story, Tammy not only repented and apologized to her husband, but she went to her church. She She got the church leadership together. She repented to her church leadership. She repented to the Lord. She submitted herself to her church and said, I need restoration, I need healing, I need hope. I feel dirty, I feel tainted. And over the course of a year, year and a half, two years, Tammy's church and church leadership and Christ Jesus brought her through restoration and healing. Today, Tammy works. She has a job and supports herself. Today, Tammy has... No male relationship, still to this very day. She has no male relationship, not because she doesn't want a, doesn't want a boyfriend and doesn't want an, a future husband, no. She, she doesn't need to have a man in her bed to tell her who she is because Jesus is telling her who she is. Tammy, today, is doing very well. Isn't this a strange story? Because the one who was hurt continues to get more hurt. The one who committed the offense is doing great. Second story, the book of Philemon. If you've ever read the book of Philemon in the New Testament, then you know what I'm going to tell you. If you haven't, I encourage you to read it. It's a very short book, but I can summarize it in just a moment or two. Philemon was a wealthy businessman. One day found out that somebody had stolen some farm equipment from his business. Philemon is irate. The thief, his name is Onesimus. I've heard some people say one Simus. That's okay too if you want to say one Simus, but it's Onesimus. And Onesimus, after he steals the farm equipment, probably sells it and gets some money. He runs for his life. While Onesimus, this is cool. I love it, man. I don't care. You can run as far as you want from God. You can think you're running into the military. You think you can run. You can just act bad, and you can run and do bad things and end up in prison. Man, you can't outrun the long long arm of God. So he's running away from the situation because it's bad. I mean, thieves were potent. They could be punishable. It could be punishable by death. Philemon had every right that he could, he could catch the thief and the thief could be killed. So Onesimus is running for his life. And who does he run into? <laughs> the Apostle Paul. And while he is with the Apostle Paul, Paul teaches him about the saving mercy and grace of God. Onesimus heart is broken. He repents to God of his life he's lived. And then Paul the Apostle says, Onesimus, you need to go back to Philemon and you need to make your wrongs right. Paul pens a letter to Philemon, which you and I have in our Bible, the book of Philemon. It's a letter. He pens a letter to Philemon and he basically says this, the thief is no longer a thief. He's a born-again brother. Onesimus is coming home to make things right with you, and Paul basically says to Philemon, you have two options, Philemon. You have every right in the world to have him put to death because he stole from you. He was a thief. Or, Philemon, you have the opportunity to embrace him as a brother and forgive him. 
It doesn't mean the two won't work it out. It doesn't mean the thief is off scot-free. It doesn't mean the thief doesn't work for Philemon to work off what he stole, right? It just means an attitudinal approach to the situation now. And Paul was saying, don't be unforgiving, but be forgiving. Read it. Philemon forgives. And here's the cool part. Both men prosper in life. Here's the third true story. Yours. What's your story? You've been hurt. Somebody victimized you. Somebody stole something from you. Somebody, I promise you, if you have red blood and you're alive in this place right now, somebody's hurt you. Chances are, with statistics not getting better but worse, that abuse and neglect just continues to skyrocket when we're talking about children. There used to be a day when they said that 90% of women before they reached the age of 18 years of, of age had been violated physically by somebody. I'm not sure what that stat is today. That stat is a little bit old. The, the statistic for men was not that high. At the same time, it was more down around the 60 or 65 percentage of men before the age of 18 had been abused, you know, physically or sexually. And I would say for men specifically, over the last 15 years, that statistic has just gone through the roof, even higher. What emotional, what physical pain did you suffer? I do believe, I do believe it was either my wife or one of my wife's brothers in church, it was not you, you're, you're taking the innocence, that, that mom took one of your brothers by the ear, was taking him out to get his due, you know, and all the way out from front to back, he's screaming, don't spank me, don't beat me, don't beat me, mama. Mama, don't beat me, don't beat me, mama. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, the good old days, right? What's your story? Here, jot this down. It's my last point this morning. Let me tell you what I've learned over the course of 40 42, 3, 4 years. I'm, I'm 50, I'm going to be 52 this coming January. I'm still 51. Good math, right? Yeah. But I, I've learned something since my boyhood through my teen and young adulthood to today. You may want to jot these down. I'm going to give you the quick version, okay? Because I, I really want us to have some altar time this morning. So if, if you feel like I'm doing an injustice, you know, then maybe you can go to Puerto Rico with Rob where Rob said, what was it, Rob? Uh, there was an hour and a half worship service and an hour and a half preaching. And they think they have it rough here with 40 or 45 minutes, but we send, send them to Puerto Rico with you and have church for three hours and, and then, yeah. <laughs> Jot this down. I, I don't want to do injustice, but this is what I've learned about unforgiveness. I've learned that unforgiveness interferes with my future hopes and dreams. How does it do that? Unforgiveness interferes with my future hopes and dreams. How does it do it? It first of all, inter it interferes with my understanding of grace. What's grace? Oh, Steve Agee is back there. He'll love this one. Grace is when you get something that you do not deserve. You were speeding. Not you in particular, but you were speeding. And you got stopped and you know that you're, you deserve a ticket, and that could be, you know, 150, 175 bucks or more, and as you're rolling down the window with your registration and your insurance card in hand, well, I was doing the old-fashioned way, was do the new way, right, the new way, the officer peeks his head in and says, have a great day, young lady, and hands you a $100 bill. 
Whoa! See, that's grace. When you have committed an offense and you get something from someone that you don't deserve, that's what Jesus did. And because Jesus did that for us, I have a couple of scriptures up there if you want to jot them down, you can. Um, if you and I do not embrace grace personally, I'm asking you this question, how in the world, how in the world will you ever receive grace from your Father? How will you ever understand grace from God if you yourself do not have the ability to extend grace to others? Um, is this where my difficult verse is? Let me see here. Um, no, I think it's the next one. So let me just, let me go through this. Again, no injustice, but unforgiveness. Here's the other thing it does. It interferes with my faith. By faith, you're saved. By faith, you're filled with Holy Spirit. By faith in God, your needs are provided every single day from God. It is faith in God that He can take those hurts from yesterday and He can heal a broken life and a broken heart. Yes, you will remember. You may take some thoughts to your grave, but somehow Father has a way of taking the things that the devil meant for bad and God will use them for good. He'll pour, literally, he'll pour through your pain. I can't remember if I said this here this morning. I put a, I put a video this morning on, on my social media. I think that's where I said this. I don't think I've said this yet here today, but I'm glad I'm remembering it because it's important. To date, all of these years that I've been in church, Missy, the people who I've watched who have sometimes the strongest ministries in the church, in the church family, People who tend to have the, the greatest impact on others, hear me now, are people who are successfully ministering through their deepest pain. I remember sitting one time in a conference, and man, the guy who was preaching, I mean, he had us all like, we were like, he was just preaching in a way that, oh my goodness, you, he was reading your mail. He was, he was just like looking in your eyes, clean down through to the bottoms of your feet. It seemed like he could see everything. And Holy Spirit was just moving through him and you could feel the healing. And I remember a pastor uh, that actually dedicated my oldest daughter, uh, a pastor friend, he leaned over to me and he said this to me. He said, that guy's got some pain in his life. And I'm just like 20-something years old. Karen, how old would I have been when, when Alyssa was dedicated? Mid-20s, maybe? Late 20s? No older than some of you that are here today. And he leaned over to me because we were sitting with this couple in this pastor's conference. And he said, he said that guy's got some pain in his life. And I'm thinking, man, he's got a great anointing. This guy can preach. Wow. And he said to me, I promise you that this guy's anointing on his life has come because he and God have gone to some dark, deep places where he's had some hurts. I tucked that away in my spirit and I thought about that for years. Like you, I've had things done to me. I've had things said about me. I've had things come my way that have hurt deep from a very young age. I'm also here to tell you today that it is by faith in my God mm, that he has been able to take me to those deep places. And the same Jesus who saved me, the same one who sent Holy Spirit to comfort me, is the same one who will help me to take my pain and turn it into a privilege for the kingdom of God. I'm almost done. I've also learned that my unforgiveness will interfere with my ability to give and accept love. Here's, here's the scripture that isn't pretty, that hurts a little. 1 John 4, 19 and to 21, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they haven't seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Oh, but pastor, that's not the problem. I love the people that I go to church with. 
I love the people that I worship with. I love Dave and Glenda. Who could not love Dave and Glenda? They're such wonderful people. The question is, who's your brother, ladies? Who's your sister? I'm here to tell you it's the same person. And I've preached an entire message on this. You can find on our website that dealt with the Good Samaritan. Who, while on his journey, came across a man who many had already passed by, was beaten and in a pool of blood. Others were walking on the other side of the street. He could be an addict. He could be a thief. He's done something. He probably got what he deserved. But the Samaritan picks him up, puts him on his mule, takes him to an inn, pays for the, the, the lodging, says, get this man whatever he needs to recover, and when I come back, I'll pay the debt. I will take care of it. The question is, Who's your brother? Who's your sister? Who's ever in front of you at the moment? Like the Samaritan. So indeed, the person who has caused you your deepest pain, I'm here to tell you today, this is, this is good preaching whether you think so or not. The one who has caused you the most pain in your life, if you rewind, that's your brother. That's your sister. I know this is hard. It's hard for me. Because I've walked similar paths as you. I've had similar experiences as you. I said, Lord, help me to be able to give and to accept love. And God says, for you to do this, it's going to take my grace. And the last thing I found that unforgiveness interferes with my ability to make wise choices. Remember I told you I was going to give you a heavenly scripture? Here it is, James 3.17. I don't even know if you realize that this verse was in the Bible. James 3.17, kind of tucked in the New Testament away and small. And matter of fact, it's not even, in, it's not even the entire verse. It's just a portion of that verse. It's kind of tucked in there that says, James 3.17, A, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. So unforgiveness interferes with all of those things, but here is probably the thing that you should be the most concerned about today as you stand with me this morning. Oh, we're doing great on time. Stand with me this morning, and we're going to open these altars in just a moment. Wisdom from heaven enables us to ask that important question. In light of my past experiences, current circumstances, and future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing to do? We go before God. We go to our Christian spirit-filled friends. We form a group of people that is praying with us and are, are, are fasting for us. And, and we, what is the why? And sometimes we don't have that. Sometimes it's... It's an immediate thing. Father, help me to make the right, this invitation, this potential relationship, this opportunity. Lord, you know, I'm laying it before, in light of my past experiences, current circumstances, future hopes and dreams, Lord, help me. I need, I'm at a crossroad. A decision needs to be made. I have to make this decision. Lord, help me. I'm telling you here today, if you are not getting heavenly wisdom, boy, oh boy, are you missing it. You wonder why some Christian folk can do the stupidest of things. Don't you dare look around. You just keep looking right up here at me. Don't you dare. You wonder why some Christian folk can get in to the most stupid relationships. They can, they can jump into the most stupid opportunities and they can take the most stupid invitations. You know why? It's because they're not getting heavenly wisdom. There's probably, Dan, many reasons why we don't get heavenly wisdom. One is, God said, you ask not, you, you have not. You don't ask, you don't receive. That, that's one. But here's another. How about unforgiveness in our heart? This is what I'm suggesting this morning. Uh, you can just, you can call this another, another message from Pastor Darren. 
you can walk out of here today and say, oh, that was another good one. Or you can walk out of here today and say, that's the worst sermon I've ever heard him preach in five years. He's been here. It's okay. It's okay. But I'm going to suggest today that for some, your key to overcoming your past hurts is forgiveness. The key for you to overcoming future hurts is having a heart and walking in forgiveness. Why? Because that's when heavenly wisdom can be applied. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Thank you for your patience today. I know this was a strong word, and I I really pray in my heart of hearts today that you're not seeing the pain of this message, but rather you are seeing the beauty of it. Oh my goodness, Pastor Darren, beauty? How in the world can there be beauty in this message? Because it's made me think of things that I thought I had stuffed down deep enough to forget. See, there's the problem. You've stuffed some things down so deeply you've not dealt with them. You've not let Holy Spirit help you deal with them. You are are on the bad end of the stick with some relationships, some opportunities, and some invitations because you have yet to be exposed to the forgiveness that opens the door to heavenly wisdom that you might make wise choices and that God, see, remember what I said earlier, that, that, that in our lives, it will not only cause us to make poor decisions, but it impacts how others treat us. I'm telling you here today, if you want others to treat you better, if you want others to promote you, if you want others to love you, if you want others to care for you. You'll plead with God today like Tammy did. God, forgive me and give me a heart of forgiveness. You'll plead with God the way Philemon did, who was the offended. God, forgive Onesimus and help me to forgive Onesimus. Or we can walk out of here like Charlie's today. We can walk out of here bringing the same junk that we walked in here with. Be treated no better than how we've been treated. Love no deeper than how we've loved. And forgive no stronger than how we've already forgiven. Having a victim mentality is robbing you. So I want us to do this today. I'm going to ask, would, would, and I, we've been doing this for a while, and if you're visiting today, I, hey, just, just join the crowd, because your family, if you're visiting, you're still your family. God loves you, but I wonder if just, you know, right here in the front, you guys would begin it. Just begin to come forward, and let's just all line up right across the whole front of this sanctuary this morning. Just come from the back and come from the front. Man, if if you're a Christian, you love the Lord, maybe Holy Spirit speaking to you about something in your life today that you want to bring, and you want to lay it down at the altar and say, Lord change me, heal me, fix me, deliver me, work on me, come to, but just let's all come as one great big family and stand together here in this altar area today. People are still coming. If you're in the front, just step a little closer so people behind you can, well, you can't get any closer, can you? (laughs) So people coming behind you, they can get as close as they want to, too. Are you ready? I'm going to tell you, this, this journey, Isaiah, man and I don't know how much of my sermon you caught this morning but maybe when I was your age I probably caught about maybe 5 or 6 percent of what the pastor said on any given Sunday morning you know but man if somebody could have told me when I was your age that my hurts I was already by your age carrying hurts from some things that had been done to me And I never realized, Lola, how those things were going to manifest into my young adulthood. I didn't realize, Mary, how those things would affect me in my adulthood. I didn't realize how some of those things would affect me in my calling, in my job, my vocation, ministry. I didn't realize it then. And, of course, more hurts pile up. And then, of course, let's not leave this out. Hurt people hurt people. 
So I've hurt some people. And then more people have hurt me. And then I hurt some more people. And where did it all begin, Peggy? It all began when someone introduced me to being a victim. It was against my will. But I was introduced anyway. Just like many of you here today. And then I take that victim mentality and it begins to grow in my life. But I'm here to join you, my friends. And in this little short series, compared to the others, it'll be a short series. I'm here to say, victim. Come on, victim. Victim. How about all the youth? And I, Not all the youth are here today, so you guys are going to have to shout this loud. You're going to have to make up for the ones that aren't here today. Come on, victim. Yes, all the men. Victim. All the ladies. Victim. All right, listen. It's time. Clifford's probably going to lead us in a song or two. If you want extra prayer, I'm going to pray, but if you want someone to lay hands on you, to join hands with you to pray about something specifically. Danny, you can stay for a little bit. My wife is over here. Uh, Dave and Glenda, you're over here. Jeff Richardson's over here. Uh, Missy, okay. We have enough people here to pray if you want special prayer. But here we go right now. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, I uncover my pain. I reach back a lot of years. I reach deep into my mind. I reach deep into my spirit. And I take and I peel the layers off. The layers that I have put on my pain because I was trying to hide myself from it. I was trying to hide it from me. I thought this was the way I was supposed to handle it. My mind intentionally our mind to protect our sanity covers up things that the hurts and the pains and but I, I reach way down and I peel back the layers of years and things and maybe other hurts and other pains and I peel it back and I expose way down to the root today and I ask today Jesus not that you would only touch my heart but that you would touch my deepest of deepest of deep pain. And that you would work your healing from the bottom. Woo! Somebody's feeling it right now. Maybe not everybody. But there's somebody in this standing here right now. You just went deep. And now, now just come with me. Come from that deep. And somebody's actually doing this, and, and, and you're feeling Holy Spirit kind of taking this quick walk through and this quick journey. Listen, you don't need 10 years of counseling. You don't need a pill for this. I'm, I'm here to tell you today, maybe you need a pill. You have a, a chemical imbalance, but, but, but you don't need a pill to receive Jesus' healing. We're, we're not handing out happy pills here. Jesus is bringing healing way down deep where you need it the most. The Bible teaches us that Jesus, not me, not your neighbor, not your grandma, but Jesus was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was laid upon him, and by his stripes I am healed in Jesus' name. I reach to the deep. Every step of that journey of people that I hurt because hurt people hurt people and more people that hurt me of every bad relationship and every stupid opportunity that I walked into and every stupid invitation I took and, and trying, to, trying to lean on men or trying to lean on a woman to tell me who I am and not listening to the voice of Jesus. Today, I find healing. I find healing. I find healing. Oh, and I might need some brothers. Danny, come on up here, man. I love you, bro. Come on up. Henry, you here too? Danny and Henry, come on up. I may need some brothers. Come on, one on one side of me and one on the other. I may need some brothers to take me by the hand at times and pray with me and stand with me and say, Darren, hey, you can make it. You can take it. <laughs> you can make it. There's going to be times when I, I need those small groups in my church or I just need my pastor or I need my youth pastor. I, I need one of our staff team. I, I need one of our leaders. In our, I need one of the pillars of our church, some of the women and the men in this church who have been through a lot for a lot of years 
to lay hands on me or take me by the hand and to pray for me. But I know, Lord, that you have done things even this very morning inside of us that nothing, no man could ever do or conjure up because it only comes from you. So, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters today. I pray for our unforgiveness. That as we begin to root way down deep to where unforgiveness is and we begin applying forgiveness to those, those, those terrible situations, that, Lord, you're going to heal us in a way that is going to be absolutely remarkable. I thank you today, Lord, for your touch. I give you the praise. I give you the honor. I give you the glory. It's in Jesus' name. And come on, everybody can say amen and amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise today.